And we thought 1 Corinthians was something. Man. Well, let's go ahead and we'll pray and ask the Lord to bless our time in his word. Amen. Amen. And welcome to anybody who's online. I'm trying to remember that you guys are there too. And uh, it's all one big church, isn't it, eventually? Sometimes we're seeing people that are listening to us in Pakistan. <laughs> How wonderful is that? Yep. Wonderful, especially since that's a Muslim nation and the gospel is going out. What a blessing. Yep. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for the privilege of serving you. Thank you for taking these, these lives of ours that were headed for disaster, Lord, and you redeemed us. Thank you so much, Lord. Fill us with thankfulness, Lord. Because in the midst of these trials, Lord, and the things going on in our world, we can get easily into being just always wanting to be right, always arguing and trying to get our point across. But Lord, you've called us to a higher place, Lord. A place where the grace that you pour into us actually pours out of us. So, Father, I just ask you, would you give us and grant us the spirit of revelation that we might understand your word? We need to understand ourselves. We need to understand also, Lord, the things that trip us up, the things that have a hold of our heart. And we just want to surrender those things to you today. We sang a song. And, Lord, we don't want that just to be lip service. We want it to be borne out in our lives, Lord. And we love you for what you're going to do, and we thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <laughs> amen. Well, let's go ahead and read the passage first. Paul says there in chapter 9 of 2 Corinthians, Now concerning the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you. For I know your willingness, about which I boast of you to the Macedonians, and that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal has stirred up the majority. Yet I have sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this respect, that as I said, you may be ready. Lest if some Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to mention you, should be ashamed of this confident boasting. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time, and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised, that it may be ready as a manner of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. But this I say, he who sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity for God loves a cheerful giver and God is able to make all grace abound towards you that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work as it is written he has dispersed abroad he has given to the poor his righteousness endures forever now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness while you are enriched in everything for all liberality which causes thanksgiving through us to God. For the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints but also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God. While through the proof of this ministry, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them and all men. And by their prayer for you who long for you because of your exceeding grace of God in you. Verse 15. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Love that line. Love that line. Speaking of things that I love, I don't know about you, but my mom, and I would arm wrestle you over this, my mom made the best spaghetti. She made the best, and she's not even Italian. 
She made the, I mean, and so imagine if, if I'm saying that to you, and I just keep telling you and telling you day after day, week after week, my mom makes the best spaghetti. <laughs> and then that's what you get. That's what's going on here, you see. So I could go on about how my mom puts pepperoni and sausage and meat in there, and it just uh, and it eventually gets you hungry. And you guys, it was like, I want to go there. And then I say, hey, guess what? My mom's cooking spaghetti tonight, and she said, I could bring you over. And then I take you over, and that can is open on the table <laughs> with a spoon. What disappointment, right? No offense to the chef, you know? Some good stuff, but that's what's going on here. Well, let's look at it. Now, concerning the ministering to the saints, it's superfluous. That's a fun word to say. Superfluous. What does he mean? It means I shouldn't have to write this, but yet he is. Right? We do this with our children. It's like, I shouldn't have to tell you for the thousandth time, don't leave a wet towel on the hardwood floors. That was my mom also. All the time. But he's saying, this ministry to the saints, this collection that we've been taking up, this money that is to supply the needs of some of your brothers and sisters in another church that we've been gathering, and you've had a year to pull it together, they're like, they've been talking, like I was talking about Mama's spaghetti. And then they're coming up with SpaghettiOs. I mean, a couple of phrases, when I read this first section, verses 1 through 5, a couple of verse, uh, uh, phrases come to mind. Talk is cheap. Here's another one. Actions speak louder than words. Or here's another one. Put your money where your mouth is. Here's what it says in Matthew 26, 41. It's up on the slide here for you as well. Keep watching and praying. Jesus speaking. Keep watching and praying that you may not enter in tempta into the temptation. The spirit, it's willing. But the flesh, it's weak. The idea there is when we say we're willing to do something, and we let time pass. The Spirit started and said, yes, this is something God wants me to do, and I want to do it with all my heart, and then you don't do anything about it. And then over time, that zeal goes away. You should not have to write them, because these guys were the first ones in line. Sign us up, Paul. We want to help. we got a heart to get in there and roll up our sleeves and get in there and help these guys out. And notice what he says in verse 2. For I know your willingness about which I boast of you. He, he, boast, he boasted to them. Hey, guys, don't worry about it. I know you guys are hurting right now, but these guys over here in Corinth, they got you. They told me when I was with them. You, you should have heard Paul talking about these guys boasting about their kindness and their generosity. And their generosity stirred people up. It stirred up generosity in others. You ever been around a generous person? It stirs up generosity in you. You're like, wow, that's pretty cool, the way he just gives of himself. And then you go, hey, wait a second. Maybe I could do that. And that was what was going on. They were so willing, they were so zealous that other people were like going, yeah, you know, I want to give. Their willingness was a moving testimony to others. Giving and generosity is a little bit like yawning, isn't it? It's contagious. When you see that heartfelt generosity, you want to copy it. But here's the Corinthians on the edge of flaking out on their commitments. And I'm just going to say it now. I'm going to say it later too. But 
This is about money. Let's make no mistake about that. We're going to preach it without apology. This is about money. The Bible often talks about money. We don't talk about it every week, do we? But it's in the scriptures here. And so we're going to teach it unapologetically. Just fire it off. In a couple weeks, you probably won't hear about giving. A couple months later, you might not hear about giving. But here it is, and we'll preach it, right? Because giving is a grace. Giving is a grace of God. The fact that we could even be in a position to give is all because of God. But I want to say that it's so much more than that. So much more. It's not just money. It's everything that we are. It's the breath in our lungs. It's our relationships. The thing I notice here, and the thing we're going to talk about for the rest of our time, is that God loves a generous giver. Hey, if, if he loves a generous giver, sign me up. I want to be one of those. Because the word said very clearly that God loves a generous and cheerful giver. And we're going to get into what cheerful means. See, what, the, what is the problem, actually? See, if their zeal, which was red hot, light the fire again, Lord, right? These guys needed the fire lit again. But what's the danger? What's the problem? The danger is this. Hey, everybody, the Corinthians, they are great givers. They are going to supply your need. And then you get there, and the can of SpaghettiOs is on the table, and the people who had put their trust in what Paul was telling them, and, and these guys being spoken to by the Lord, they're going to see that the grace of giving has been tainted by their inability to follow through. See, it's about follow through, isn't it? They're not following through. Giving is contagious, but so is stinginess. Or as this passage says, it actually uses the word covetous. Covetousness springs from a lack of generosity. Verse 3. Yet I have sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain. And I, that like stopped me, and I just, you know, having worked with Italians, no offense, Vinny. We, we do have some authentic Italians here. And, and I know I've already mentioned spaghetti, but I'm going to do it later too, so we might as well just go full bore. It was a joy to work for some Italians, but, you know, this almost seems like, verse 3, it almost seems like it's like a mafia kind of thing, doesn't it? Hey, they said they was going to pay. <laughs> but hey, boss, we best send Vito and Paulie over there to make sure they don't get no ideas about not paying us. <clears throat> this kind of seems like that, doesn't it? Hey, we're going to send some muscle over there and make sure you give. No, no, no. Don't misunderstand because we do not. We do not. I emphatically, is passing a plate good? Yes, because there's this awesome pressure to do what should be natural. But if we pass it 10 times, and then I, I berate you and say, I know you got more in them pockets of yours. Dig deeper. You know, that's beating the sheep. God, we don't need to do that. We have a little box in the back. We've never been laid on a bill. Why? Because we preach about Jesus and what he has done, and then we look and we go, Lord, what do you want me to do? Well, I want you to share in communion. I want you to be baptized, and I want you to be cheerful givers. <laughs> okay, Lord, no problem. Sign me up, right? So I don't think that's what's going on here. I don't think that Paul is sending mafia muscle down to the Corinthians to rough them up a little bit. But he is sending these guys as a form of accountability. And I think that's healthy, and I think it's good. I think it's very biblical. We all need a little nudge sometimes, don't we? We need a nudge. Uh, for instance, 
we started a thing and you are welcome to join us, no pressure. But on one of our apps, we started a thing, and it's kind of corny, the name of it, but we'll just excuse that. Um, it's called Blue Letter Bible Buddies. And so through the app, we're going to read through the Bible in a year. And I was talking with Kelly the other day. Yeah, there's a, there's a, a pressure between all of us. Hey, did you read this week? Did you read this week? boy. He knew I was going to come and ask him. Why am I asking him? I guess that's the point, though, isn't it? You did? Well, good. I can check you off on the I'm a good boy meter because that's what's going to get you into heaven. Hmm. No. I'm doing that because I love him because I know that the more he reads the word, the more it's going to get into his heart, and the more it's in his heart, he's going to be ready for whatever comes at him. That's why it's a positive pressure. Yeah, passing the plate, fine. Passing it 14 times. You didn't give it. No, that's wickedness. It's a lack of trust in God is what it is. You know, baptism. That's the same thing. It's a positive peer pressure. Nick is going to get dunked. He is going to be the most senior person I've ever baptized. 91. Can I tell a little bit of your story? A little bit? A little bit of your story? After about four weeks of coming here and hearing the word of God, okay, I don't want it about uh, the name of a church or even about me. It's about this right here. He said, I've been going to church for 50 plus years, even maybe more. And I've learned more in these last four weeks of coming here from you guys than I did in all those 50 years. Isn't that awesome? And now his heart's Jesus is, and now he wants to get baptized. You know what the average is, or like the, they say the age that you want to make sure you get saved by? 17. Most people get saved before the age of 17. <laughs> Praise God. And Jean, Jean, same kind of a very similar story. Been going to church all her life. What, Jesus loves me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Read it right here. It's right here. And she gave her heart to the Lord, and she wants to be baptized. How awesome. Praise God. What a day. What a day. Verse 4. Lest if some Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared. See, that's, that's the heart. He doesn't want them to be ashamed. He's boasted on He believed the best in them. And now there's a danger of that blowing up in their faces. And I think Paul is more worried about them than he is about himself. Although I'm sure Paul is, you know, hey, you guys are kind of a reflection on me, and then you're a reflection on, you know. But he says, we, not to mention you. Here's what uh, Greek scholar A.T. Robertson says about that. He calls this a delicate syntactical turn. Here's what that means. Paul now gets at what he really wants to say. Here's what he wants to say. He does wish that they become ashamed. He does wish that these guys would become ashamed. It's a shame what goes on in God's church. It was a shame that they were selling little birds to poor people and jacking up the price in the temple, and Jesus was turning over tables. And we want to soften it, and we want to say, Oh, well, what are your feelings? What are your feelings? Are you, feel, you feel like you, you, you want to do that? Okay, my, my bad. But then they're talking about cohabitation or whatever the thing is. Because I feel. Because I feel it's right for me. You know what that is? That's subjective truth. This is objective truth. It's objective truth because God said it. God has proved it. And God is right. That's what our kids are growing up in, is subjective truth. Whatever is right for me. I won't say that what you're doing is bad because, hey, who am I to judge? Right? Verse 5, Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time. Amazing. 
Well, let's look at it. I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go when? To you ahead of time. And prepare, pre, the original Greek word is pro, and then another part of the word that I won't bore you with. Pro means before. So prepare beforehand. That also means before. Which he had previously, that means before, <laughs> promised that it may be ready. You see, he's like redundantly repeating himself over and over and over again. And over again. And repeating himself. Why is he doing that? Why is he doing that? He, he's making a point, isn't he? He's letting them know. Listen, this was good. What you did beforehand, right? You planned to do this. Planning is good. But you've got to follow through. You've got to follow through on what you said you were going to do. He did it ahead of time. You know, and without that peer pressure thing, positive, holy peer pressure, right? Not the peer pressure that gets you to do the wrong thing. What started out as generosity is going to become this. You remember that from last week? You remember that? This is how most people give. Oh, got it. Okay, you can have that. Get out, get out of there. That's mine. That, just that right there. Well, we want you to dig deeper. <laughs> okay, hang on a second. I got it. That's what grudgingly means. If I don't plan to give, I probably won't. Right? If I don't plan, if I don't say in the beginning of the month, I'm going to give to God first. I'm going to give him my first fruits. That's the biblical principle, that I give him my first fruits, and I go and want to give him my last fruits. First of all, it might not be very pleasing to the Lord because we're giving him our leftovers. And what if at the end of the month there's nothing left over? Give to God first. Plan. Plan to give. And again, it's not just about money, is it? It's my time. Because this principle covers a lot of stuff. Very practical point. Plan to give. God doesn't want you to just be a cheerful talker. He wants you to be a cheerful giver. Verse 6. But this I say, he who sows sparingly, I'm hungry. Hang on a second. Is that rude of me? <laughs> I remember in school, they're like, if you didn't bring enough for everybody, put it away. Okay, but I'm just, I'm hungry. No, I'm just kidding. Reaping and sowing, right? Some of us know what that means, but the younger people might not know. Sowing means to sow seed. That's sowing bountifully. And this is how we sometimes sow. The principle is very simple, isn't it? It's science. It's actually true science. If I scatter seed all around, if I'm sh sharing the gospel, somebody's going to get a hold of it. But I'm waiting for everything to just be perfect and all the stars to align and all that stuff, and then I'm going to share the gospel. No, you don't know if you have time. You don't know if they have time. Just spread it wherever you go. Because if I sow like that, if I sow my time, my care and concern for others, if I pray this much, or should I pray that much? You see the principle? If we sow sparingly, the harvest that we get, the reaping that happens, is going to be in comparison to whatever we give. We want to be careful. We want to be careful, because some want to twist this, don't they? Verse 7, so let each one of us give as he purposes in his heart. Purpose means to, to do it ahead of time. What is on your heart to give? That's what you should give. Don't wait. Do it. As he purposes his heart, not grudgingly, not with a sour, reluctant mind. You know, Jesus warned about those that fast and then tell everybody about it, right? What's wrong with Bill? 
I'm fasting. I'm being spiritual. <laughs> or of necessity. That's a duty. A duty. The Pledge of Allegiance at school. Right? We, well, we can't let that get out of the school. I got a question for you. When's the last time you think that a child said the Pledge of Allegiance and thought deeply about what was being said. They say it because it's a duty. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying that students, when they hear that, their mind is on Susie or John or one who's got a piece of gum for them. They're not thinking of all the people that died so that they could have freedom that they do. Do you see that? It's a duty. Baptism could seem like a duty, but it shouldn't be, right? So that's what Paul is saying. It's, it ought not to be, our giving shouldn't be a duty. You're not, giving, you're not giving to please God. You're giving because God has already pleased you. He's already given to you. You see, who is the greatest giver in the world? God. God is the cheerful giver. Man, those guys aren't getting it. What's wrong with them? Drunkards and all them sinners down there. Ah, forget it. Imagine if he gave his only begotten son grudgingly. If he gave his only begotten son out of a sense of duty to himself. Well, I promised I would do that. So I'm going to go ahead and do it, I guess. No. To be a cheerful giver means I give like God gave. Right? He gave his most precious thing that he had. And it just starts from there. Right? He gave us the Holy Spirit. He gave us his word. He gave us one another. And sometimes he gave us one another and we wonder, Lord, could you give me somebody else? But... God is wise. He brings us around. God, could you give us another pastor, by the way, while we're talking about it? God loves a cheerful giver. Wait till I tell you. This is, this is great. Wait till I tell you what the Greek word for cheerful is. <laughs> it's hilarious. No, I mean, seriously, it's, that's the word. It means hilarious. It's the same word. It's a cognate of our English word, hilarious. Cheerful giver is one. You ever had, don't you just love having like one of those belly rolls where you, you can't even like, you feel like if I laugh anymore, yeah, I'm going to pass out or something or I'm going to blow an artery or something. You know, you just, I love that. It happened to me one time during my brother's wedding. <laughs> I couldn't stop laughing. There was nothing funny too. That was what was hilarious about it. God, you are so this is, God, you are so ridiculously good to me. I just want to give to you. I just want to serve in your church. This is so this is amazing. I can't believe how good you are to me. I can't believe it. It's hilarious. That's how our giving should be, just ridiculous and, and hilarious. Isn't that a great word? It's hilarious, isn't it? Hilarious. God, you're so good to me. Have it all. And God says, well, let's just start with a tenth. One of the most famous stories, J.C. Penney. He started giving a tenth. He gave his life to the Lord, and his stores started going crazy. And he's like, Lord, I'm just going to start giving more than a tenth. And by the end of his life, they say that he was giving away 90% of his income. And God just kept blessing him. But here's the trap. This is not a formula. And that's where the prosperity people, have I told you I don't like those people? No, I love them. I hate what they're teaching. Let me clarify. I love them and I do pray for them. But it's a wicked, wicked doctrine. If you just give your life to Christ, everything is going to be great and positive attraction. And everything I say out in the universe, it's going to come back to me. I need a Cadillac. Poof, there it is. I need a bigger house. Poof, look at the Lord did for me you know 
But there is some truth. Look, if we'll give, not grudgingly, and if we give like a cheerful giver, verse 8 says this, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you. You know what that's saying? That's your safety net. Listen, God will take care of you. Can I testify to God's goodness? For four years, we lived on the mission field, and we never begged or cried and said, I got three kids to feed, and if you really love God, you'll send some money right away. Not once. Did I ever say that, hon? I never said that. God just did it. God said, go. And our responsibility was just to obey, and he did it for four years. In fact, we calculated it at the end of the, our four years of time, because some months were like, whoa, Lord, you remember your promise, right? Because some months were like, wow, 150 bucks just came in. That'll last for a couple days. And you're on the mission field and can't work. You're like, that's nerve-wracking. Four years. Divide up all those months into the total amount of money that God provided through generous, cheerful givers. We had $10 above what we needed every month. It's God good. He's trustworthy. This is one of the things he says, test me in this, right? Test me in this but don't test them so that you can be rich. This is not what it's about because it is talking about righteousness. He says righteousness twice, doesn't he? He says righteousness. These acts of righteousness and it will bear the fruit of righteousness. God is the cheerful giver. Look what it says. As it is written, he has dispersed abroad. Just like I just did there and made a mess out of the floor. Great job. Made a mess. But God dispersed. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. Sometimes we don't like that. We look in the world and go, why are the wicked prospering? The psalmist wrestled with that too, didn't they? But he dispersed abroad because he's the, I mean the cheerful giver. And I got to say, like, how dare we not be the same? Isn't that what we want to be? I want to be like Christ. If we say, I want to be like Jesus, and I do, and I want you to be like Jesus. I want you to be a reflection of him just as much as he was the exact representation of God on the planet. He wants us to be the same. He wants us to be cheerful givers. He doesn't want to have to pry our fingers off our stuff, which is really just his stuff. He's dispersed it. God, he's the cheerful giver. And notice what it says. He uses the word all or a form of that in these verses here. How may, now may he who supplies the seed and the sower. Did you catch that? He who supplies the seed to the sower and bread for food. Well, wait a second, Lord, I made the bread. Well, how'd you make the bread? With the seed that I provided. It's all God's. You see, it's like, where are we going to take credit? Where are we going to take credit in this giving thing? If we keep our eyes on the Lord, we're not going to take any credit. You know, see, part of the problem with the prosperity thing is, I start to go, look at how awesome my faith is. My faith is amazing because God is blessing me so. It becomes about me. And it always was, wasn't it? If I buy into that, it's always about me. I want financial stability. I want comfort. That is not the call of the Bible. That is not the call of Jesus Christ. The call of Jesus Christ is to move toward need and not comfort. We are not to be moving toward our comfort. We are to move away from our comfort so that we can supply the needs of others. And the Corinthians, in their comfort, had started to forget how willing they were, but when the rubber met the road, they were like, I can't do it now. Now is not a good time. I know I should have planned better. Verse 10. And what does he do? And see, this is the dangerous one. This is really the one that gets twisted, isn't it? Send in your seed. You can hear it, can't you? You've seen it on TV. 
Hopefully you haven't given any money to him. He will supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. I only have this. The widow only had the might, but she gave it. And what God is saying, just like the multiplication of the fish and the loaves, we give what we have. We purpose in our heart to give and we do that. And God multiplies it, not for us, because it's an act of righteousness to give so that others can be blessed. Remember, this is a collection that is for others. Paul does say somewhere down the line, they might take care of you when you have need. But be careful. This is not saying that if we just sow our seed, we're going to have everything that we want. Because I got news for you. You don't want that prayer to get answered. Verse 11. While you are enriched in everything for all... See, that's what it's about. This is the only time where it's really good to be a liberal. Sorry. (laughs) I'm sorry. While you are enriched in everything for all liberality, that means to be giving. The true sense of this word, it means to be generous and to be hilariously generous, to give. Why were we blessed? To be a blessing. I've shared it before, but I just want to share it real quick. Did you know that the priests in the temple during certain festivals, would take a pitcher of water, walk outside the doors of the temple, and be standing on the steps, not unlike these here, but they were much bigger and longer and probably made out of marble, right? Instead of carpet. And they would take that pitcher of water and they would spill the water down the steps of the temple to symbolize that they were to be a blessing in this world to others. Isn't that cool? See, you're blessed to be a blessing. You're not blessed so that you can keep it in my hand, you know? Because if this is me, God can't have my heart if, if this is how I am with the stuff that he has given me. Everything that I have is from the Lord. And he's enriched me. And these guys are being enriched and they're being called to make sure that they follow through on their commitments. And notice the net result which causes thanksgiving through us to God. We need to be thankful to God. Stop and think for all the things that the Lord has done for you. Come and see what the Lord has done. He's done so much for us. Right? See, if I'm thankful, if I forget, because this world wants to steal our joy, doesn't it? It wants to get us so worked up and talking about politics, which it just doesn't, that's, this is life, not that. Yes, cast your vote, absolutely. It's a no-brainer, right? I'm not going to use this pulpit to tell you that you shouldn't kill babies, because you know that. Thou shall not. Simple. One believes one way, one believes the other. You, I vote through this, right? I'm thankful for my vote, and that's all I'll say on that. Except, no, I'm just... (laughs) Verse 12, for the administration of this service, diaconus, right? The administration of this service not only supplies the need, it's, it's a way that we get, when we give, it's an act of service. Going back to our time on the mission field, We were not the heroes of that story. Jesus is. All that we did was obey. And don't you think that every one of those people that gave, some of the people we don't even know who they are, they would show up in our our statement, and I'm like, who is that? How did they find out about us? And they just gave, right? They're part of the story, too. There's some that send, and then those who send. Or I said that wrong. Some who are sent and those who send. There it goes. It's a privilege either way. They're all equal. But also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God. While through this proof of this ministry, the proof, they say, is in the pudding, right? 
Making promises is one thing, but following through on the promises is another. I promise to love my wife all the days of my life, but after the first fight that we have, I'm going to bail on her. No, I follow through. I trust in God's promises. I follow through. They glorify God for the obedience of your confession. I think Paul's kind of digging one more time in there. Listen, you confess something. You said you're willing to do something. Now do it. I think this is wonderful. I really do. I think we all need that from time to time. Sometimes we can be too dancing around things and soft, and it's like you see somebody that's like heading the wrong way, warn them you're going the wrong way. You can't stop them from continuing to go, but at least you can say, hey, that is the wrong way. This is the right way. If you want, come follow me as I follow Jesus. Verse 14, and by their prayer for you, who long for you. They've been praying. Do you want to, is there somebody tough in your life? Somebody that's hard to love? You got anybody like that in your life? You want to know how to start to love them? Start praying for them. These guys were praying for these guys. They were so juiced by their example, and they're praying for them and praying for them. And how much of a disaster would that be if they come and go, oh, Oh, man, I was watching soap operas. I was, I was dusting, and I forgot to make the spaghetti. Oops. But I do have a can of SpaghettiOs. But these guys were praying, and they were longing for them to come. That's that koinonia fellowship, right? Pray for one another. Pray. I mean, like... Pray. You know that the Lord's praying for you? You know that the Lord is up in heaven, the enemy's up there going, hey, that Rick guy, he doesn't get it. You see, he sinned again. And Jesus is right there going, nope, nope. He's, he's, he's ours. He's ours. Defending you. He's defending me. He's defending all of you. He's praying for you. I pray that your faith may not fail, the Lord says. Thanks be to God. It's indescribable. Paul, I love that. Paul just, I mean, a guy didn't lack for words. I, I think it was Paul that uh, put a guy out of a window, didn't he? Yeah. Is that Paul? I didn't want to misspeak. It just popped in my head. But he preached for a couple hours, so by that I can go for a little bit longer. But he preached so long, the guy fell asleep, and he was sitting in the window, and boom, falls to his death. Paul lays on top of him, prays for him, resuscitates him, and says, hey, get back up there. I got two more <laughs> hours, <laughs> like any good preacher would. <laughs> no, he didn't say that part. See, <laughs> that's right. And whoever that was for, no, I'm this past couple of weeks, I've had this image in my mind a lot. And it might take some explanation, but there's an expression, pulling the cart, putting the cart ahead of the horse. See, the cart is supposed to be in the beginning, and pulling the cart, just like a truck would pull a trailer, right? So what if I put the trailer in front of the truck? Let's, let's make it modern. What's going to happen? Anything? It's not going to go. It's not going to go anywhere, is it? You could try to push it, but it's, it's, it's not a good way to go. Everything that we have comes from God. It's all about what he has done. And maybe I'm speaking to somebody online, maybe I'm speaking to somebody in here, but you are caught in that place where you think, if I just do enough, God will be pleased with me. And I want to tell you that that is not the way to go. It's about what God has done. Jesus was crucified on that cross. He was raised three days later from the dead. And he's seated at the right hand of God. And it's because of what he's done. And when we walk in that and we, we receive his forgiveness, now I want to do. Don't do 
to make God pleased with you. Receive what he has done. And then you'll want to do. I want to give. I want to give more. I want to be a cheerful giver. I want to be like my heavenly father, who is the greatest giver of them all. Father, we just thank you that you are a cheerful giver. It is, you know, the Bible says that what we're talking about is foolishness to those that are perishing. They're getting a gut laugh out of it too. And we do too, Lord, because we know who we are before you, Lord. And your grace abounds. And Father, I just thank you. Lord, would you create in us those cheerful, generous, giving hearts. Husbands and wives, would we give to one another in such a way. Brothers and sisters, may we give in such a way. May we be cheerful givers toward one another. May we be cheerful givers toward those who are lost, those who are in the ditch with a wheel off, not knowing where to go and where to turn. Basically, Lord, I guess I'm asking if you would just allow your grace to flow through us, that there be less and less of us to get in the way. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to share one last thing. Where I grew up in upstate New York, um, there was a lake called Green Lake. And it is a special kind of lake because it's miromictic. And what that means is there's water that flows into it, but there's no way for the water to get out. It's very deep. And at the bottom of this lake, the water is poisonous. And I thought, God wants us to be a cheerful giver because if you're going to hang on to it, you are that miramictic lake. You have an inflow from God and you don't let it out. And it's poisonous. Amen. Amen. Let's sing one more song.